and welcome to Encounter Roleplay! My name is not Encounter Will! I made that joke already. Uh, no, I am Char, I am Frost from Fire, and I will be hosting Roll Up, our brand new show here on Encounter, Fridays at 5pm EDT. Whew. And uh, for the next 16 weeks we're going to be looking at a lot of different character creations for a lot of different games and systems, some of which you may have heard of, some of which you won't have. We will have special guests here, so We'll, we'll have our hands held a little bit and we'll get to hear lots of different ways of approaching character creation because there is no one right way to do it. Every system is different and every player is different. But I hope this is just going to help uh, inspire some people to check out some new games and maybe in chat you'll find someone who's also looking for a, for a new Cthulhu game or a new Warhammer game and you can hook up and you can get into those games. We'll be using uh, snippets from the PDF so you can see what we're talking about while we're building as well as keeping an eye out for any specific questions you do have in chat. For the rolling part of Roll Up, we will be using Fantasy Grounds, which is our virtual tabletop of choice. And they are a wonderful sponsor here on Encounter of Roleplay, so please do check them out. And if you're into rolling with real dice, we will be doing, uh, I think, one dice giveaway. Today we're doing two, but normally it's going to be one dice giveaway. So thanks to our sponsors from... Uh, blah, 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 blah. Try that again. We will be doing a dice giveaway. Thanks to our sponsors tabletop loot and they have a wonderful collection of minis and ephemera so whether you're looking to represent a friend foe or just roll some dice they will have something for you today we're going to start by looking at call of cthulhu and we're specifically going to use the seventh edition chaosium books but before we get into into that side of things uh why don't we just take it back we'll take it back to the start and talk about what is Cthulhu and who better to guide us down into the the tomes and tentacles of this world than Laugh Love Lindy who has been a massive inspiration to me and I'm so glad that she had time to come here and talk to us about her characters and about how she creates characters. But Lindy, what, what is Call of Cthulhu? What, what is this crazy world about? Yes, hello, I'm, I'm Lindy, I'm alive. Um, Call of Cthulhu, um, I've been beset upon by the Elder Gods. Call of Cthulhu is a very, very fun system. I have grown to love it so, so much. It is a percentile system, the D100 system. But the main factor of Call of Cthulhu, I think, is the feel of the game. It's a little spooky, it's a little creepy, but it never starts out terribly spooky. It starts out, you're just a normal person. You're an average Joe or Jill or whoever, and you get kind of put together with this group of people and you're usually, typically, you're sent out to investigate something. So you kind of feel maybe a little Scooby-Doo-ish in the beginning because you're like, oh man, this is so much fun, we're exploring things. But then as you explore things and you discover things, there's all these things that just aren't quite right. And that's when the Cthulhu mythos kind of starts creeping in, the tomes and the tentacles. And depending on your character, and uh, the player, you, your, t your character might rationalize it as, oh, it's just a crazy ha random happenstance, or, oh, you know, weird things happen. And then some more superstitious characters might react a lot more strongly to the first signs of Eldritch Horror, as in, like, oh no, this is totally doomsday. We're all screwed. So it really just depends on who you are as a character, which is just an average Joe. And it's kind of interesting because a lot of games, you're the hero. You're this person with awesome stats and awesome skills, but in Call of Cthulhu, no. You're just a regular person who has to learn how to cope with the horrors of everything that's going on around you and either just try to survive or try to stop it. So that's that's well, what I feel. What the, the, the worst of the, the unnamed horrors, as they're known in the Lovecraft mythos, what... What are some of the terrors you have faced in the dark as your no. average Joe? Or your average uh, Mildred Crab Apple? Your average Mildred Crab Apple, your average hobo, whatever. You know, I've played a, a decent bit of Call of Cthulhu, I think uh, about a year and a half now, maybe a little longer. Um, the Elder Gods are definitely the most terrifying. I think one uh, session we spoke with, um, what's his face? He's the real cold, frosty one. My brain is really scrambled right now, but the fever is down temporarily, so. Um, there's the eye. I'll think of it later, but we met Glaki, which is 
pretty horrible terror this past season on Encounter Roleplay. Big, giant, fish-like god-man thing. Um, I don't think we've actually spoken to Kuzu. There was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of fish spawn going on. I remember there were a lot of, a lot of fish, fish people. Yeah. Fish people <laughs> are definitely a staple of Call of Cthulhu, I feel. I personally hate them. Whenever Will and makes the fish noise, I just remove the headphones. <laughs> Call it good. And of course, in uh, the in the cast times and tentacles, you were dealing with Yellow God. Oh yeah, the uh, King in Yellow. We've dealt with the King, King of yellow. yellow. We've dealt with Yog Sothoth. Uh, a lot of Yog Sothoth, actually. Um, but the King in Yellow. I really personally enjoyed the King in Yellow. He's one of the more mysterious ones, and he has his whole own city in this other little dimension, and it's it's crazy. There's also a lot of weird time stuff and interdimensional travel in Call of Cthulhu. But you usually don't get there until you're already halfway crazy, and at that point, it's like, well, <laughs> is this actually happening, or am I in a, like an insane asylum? This is just happening in my head. So, insanity is a massive mechanic in the system. Sanity how, is huge. How do you how do you feel about playing with that as, as a player? Is Was that, it is sure that sort of fun to you or terrifying? <laughs> When I first started, it was really terrifying. I was like, I don't know how to feel about this. But the longer I've played, the more I really, really like it. Um, because it makes sense. There's only so much the human psyche can handle. And making those sanity checks is just... It's a good mechanical way to see if this how badly a certain event bothers you. My favorite uh, mechanic of Call of Cthulhu that I wish every system had. Uh, now it's actually the luck mechanic. Where... Every player starts out with a certain luck score, just like sanity. Um, and you could be like, oh, well, is there a fire hide, like a fire uh, extinguisher in here? It's because the theater is on fire. You're like, I don't know. Make me a luck roll. And then if you succeed, yeah, there happens to be a fire extinguisher or something which could help you with your situation. And if you fail, it's like, no, you're, you're no, there's nothing. Nothing here yeah, at all. Nothing here. <laughs> yeah, it's I just it's a fun to mechanic. Um, and you can, of course, spend luck points. We'll get into the, the mechanics a little bit more as we're building. Mm -hmm. You can spend luck points, too. So to make successes out of near misses. So. Yeah, so I think, for me, what's always inspiring is this is so much a storytelling game. Oh, yes, you've definitely. Got this beautiful, dark, sinister, unfathomable framework from the Lovecraft Mythos. Which gives you so much room mm -hmm. to play and build, and then you've got these mechanics of the the sanity and the luck, which let like, you mm -hmm. can really influence and shape the world together and find ways around problems that aren't yes. just relying purely on just problem skill. Yeah, you have to really get creative to solve problems because it's not like again, you're not a hero, you're not D and D. You can't just go, we'll just fight the bag. You know, no, you're just all gonna die if you do that. So running is a very legitimate tactic that I highly recommend you employ most of the time. If it's just a few humans, then you know, you're kind of on even ground, depending on if you're an 86-year-old woman or someone who could actually use a weapon, you know, it just depends. Um, but it's very story-based. You are telling a story, you're solving a mystery, you're doing something along those lines, rather than just kicking butt, taking names. It's, it's a very different feel than a lot of the uh, tabletop systems I've played. Uh, thank you to no one of consequence who donates a wild magic surge for me. I will roll that in a little while and we'll see what I will have to face in this Cthulhu driven moment. Probably something awful, because isn't that what's oh, always boy. behind the door, Lindy? That usually. <laughs> that a nice surprise behind the door. I think once there's been something nice behind a door, like we were all dreading it, and then it was actually like, here's weapons, and we were like, oh, thank you. <laughs> it was almost a tears of joy moment because usually uh, you don't want to open the door, but it's it's like when you're playing a spooky video game and you're like, no, I don't want to, I don't want to go behind the door, but you know you have to open the door to progress the story. You get a lot of those feelings playing this game, and and you'd think you get used to it, but you really don't because each story is different and you're playing a different character and each character reacts to things differently, so. It's a really, so this it's a is really a, a D one hundred system, and you yeah. you roll your D one hundred, and you're looking to hit or below your target skill number. Is that is that right? Yes. So. That's how I played it. That is that is. <laughs> uh, if you uh, say you're pretty good at with like a shotgun, and you so you have a 
uh, points you get to put in from like one to a hundred. And say you put like 65 points in shotgun. You roll your D100. If it's a 65 or below, you succeed. Uh, if it's above 65, you fail. And there's some scores you're not going to be good at at all. Like, oh, I only have a five in Persuade. So your odds of succeeding on a roll like that are really slim. But it does happen. There has been times where it's like, man, I'm probably not going to succeed at this. Because the odds are so great. But you never know. So always, always, always try fun. something. Yeah, never be afraid to try something just because your stat, your, your stat and that score or ability is low. Go for it. You never know what's going to happen. And how do you approach reflecting your stats in your characters? If we start moving towards how you how you do characters, so do you, do you pay a lot of attention to those in your? Play? Um, I try to make, uh, so like I've had a couple well-rounded characters, and but I've also had a couple people who are terrible and everything else, but really good at specific things. It really just depends on how you kind of want to play it. Uh, a good stat that you can never really go wrong with is spot hidden as that's how you, <laughs> you notice stuff coming after you but also sometimes you could spot hidden and see something horrific that your character would normally be oblivious to but i'd say more often than not it's a it's a good stat to have just because it's your character's general awareness of what's going on around them what kind? um i try to just kind of think of what my character would be good at and put my stats in accordingly especially based on their profession because you don't have classes, you have professions. You're a doctor, you're a minor, you're a psychologist, or a waitress. Waitress is legitimately an occupation in this book. You can just be like, I'm a waitress there are at a hundreds cafe. Of, of career options. I was. Usually, I, I, I start with a career option. Okay, so yeah, let's discuss this. How, how do you start? What so, usually, I, I'm, uh, I pull out. Well, my first character I made, I was like, I don't know what to do, I'll play a doctor. I know what doctors do, uh, and I and she lived for like two episodes, and then I made Nancy McDrew, and I was like, I think it'd be fun. I was looking, flipping through my book, was trying to kind of figure out what I wanted to play. Right here, and I saw a private investigator. I was like, that could be fun. Let's let's see what if I could be creative with it. I think of like I look through the occupations list. I pick something I think that sounds interesting at the time, and then I try to make a fun character concept after that. It's like a super Catholic, alcoholic private investigator who've named it Nancy Mac Drew. Yeah, that's it. That's my character concept. And then I'll kind of take that and start rolling with it. And the next one after that, I was like, I'm gonna be a Russian revolutionary badass who lost <laughs> and hates communists. That's gonna be her <laughs> shtick. Uh, and I picked the uh, the soldier background, uh, like demolitions expert. And then the next one, I was like, I was the next one I made. So the more you play Cthulhu, the crazier you kind of want to get with your ideas. I was in a 16 hour car drive and I was on like hour 12 and it was, I just swapped off from driving to being a passenger, but I didn't want to go to sleep because I wanted to keep my, my fellow driver yeah. awake. And I was looking through my book and I was like, street magician, that sounds it. Hobo. No one wants to play a hobo. I'm going to be a crazy hobo. And that's where that concept came from. Let's, let's from talk about lockpick Lou for a second. Yeah. Who is my personal favorite Lindy character? So I'm just really using this as an excuse to fangirl. Let's let's talk about Lockpick Blue. How did that you so you started on this car trip? Yeah. And you said hobo. That's the one for me. Yeah. Where, where I was flipping through. I just wanted something. So I played, you know, two kind of normal-ish people and like a super badass. I was like, I don't want to play like a super melee badass again. I want someone who's maybe a little bit more mischievous. Street mischievous. And then I saw that obo was a legitimate occupation and I said that that is what I'm going to be and uh, I kind of just started rambling after that it's like well should she be like a like a chill hobo should she be like a like a like a drugged up hobo I was like no she's gonna be just crazy she's gonna have amnesia an amnesiatic hobo she doesn't know who she is before she could have been like some really poor kid, or she could have been some really wealthy person. I was like, this will be fun. It'll give Will some backstory stuff to mess with, and boy oh boy did it give Will some backstory stuff to mess with. And I decided to give her... Uh, I was rolling through accents, just accents and voices in the car, just saying random stuff, talking about the hobo life uh, that I imagined up, and my poor <laughs> husband was driving, and he was just getting a kick out of it, and I settled on, like, a basically, not Lou's voice, which is just kind of, you know, a bit messy and slightly based off cockney 
And uh, yeah, that's that's how that's how Lou, Lou was born in the depths of my own insanity and sleep deprivation. <laughs> and uh, you know, it's not a bad way to build a Cthulhu character, is because it kind of you're staying true to the the insanity mechanic of Cthulhu. Clarence would like to know how many occupations there are to choose from. There are a lot. I will open my PDF maybe and uh, look up the exact Same. number, but there are a lot to choose from. And the way it's split up is there's options for modern settings and there's more. Uh, there's options some options. For the 1920s, which is when Lovecraft was the first writing his mythos. Mm. Uh, I call it Cthulhu. The actual book was published in 1928, I believe. So you're right mm-hmm. at the heart of that roaring 20s. Weird tales time when everything's a tiny bit steampunk and crazy. Here we go. Can you see this double base spread? Are, is just these occupations. are all occupations. Uh, and we'll go more into this uh, next week. So make sure you come back next week because that's when we're going to start rolling up this new character with Lindy. I think what we're going to do today with chat is we're going to decide on a hypothetical game we're going to play. The chat, do you think in this hypothetical game, question for you. Should it be the 1920s setting or a more modern setting? Let's let's get some some votes in chat. Let's get modern or 1920s. And a big yeah. thank you to, to Mr. Grant R. Ellis for donating in support of Lindy's lovely haircut. <laughs> Thanks, Grant. Um, <laughs> look, the cool, another cool thing about Cthulhu is that you don't have to stick it in the 1920s or modern. I played a one shot few weeks ago it was like a two shot actually of Cthulhu in space it was the future we were traveling around space and it was terrifying and amazing because is, <laughs> is it aliens is it eldritch horror you could stick it literally in any time period and it will work ancient Rome modern day 1920s you really can't go wrong wild west stick it anywhere and it'll work I don't know Greg has been playing in the 1950s I think 1940s 1950s yeah he did an atomic Cthulhu uh last season, which was 1950s, I believe. So I'm just going to open up a straw poll real quick. I'm seeing a lot of opinions and there's all sorts of interesting things. But yeah, this is the great thing about this is it's not just one or the other. You can move this system to any place at any time because Eldritch Horror is always there lurking in the background, trying to find the cracks in the society, come and corrupt and come a mess of humanity and bring forward that doomsday clock. And I'm always into those sorts of systems where it's just giving you a framework to tell a story mm-hmm. and just giving you like little starting points and I'm I'm the biggest chicken, I'm the biggest baby, I don't like scary things but I found myself so enraptured with the pure gothic horror of it, the, mm-hmm. the fact you can have the aliens at chest first but you also have the creeping things in the back of your mind Oh yeah, you get all of these really cool dynamic elements to play with. Fun fact, I can't play uh, scary video games or watch horror movies. I get nightmares. Terrible, terrible, horrible nightmares and I can't sleep. I can't think of anything else. But I love Call of Cthulhu. I love the eldritch horror, gothic horror. I guess I can handle gothic horror to a certain degree. And it's just pushes the envelope enough where I'm legitimately freaked out, but in a good way when I play Cthulhu. So I can't I can't handle scary things or horror things at all. Either. What was just the- like- what would you say is the most horrific thing that's happened within a game? Not to you personally. <laughs> we, we won't dive into real trauma. Uh, but with, within a game, what's the most h- horror... Yeah, horrific thing. Mm, the most horrific things. Well, Will has done a lot to me. <laughs> Not gonna lie. Mr. Will. Will. <laughs> Same. Well, anyway. He's been my main DM. It's been Will and Ben Counter, and they're both horrifying in different ways. Uh, I'd say Will's personally messed with my my brain the most because Will and I have known each other for a while. Uh, fish babies. I really, really babies. hate fish babies. Uh, the first time we were introduced to them, yeah, the characters. It was like it was like the finale or the second to last episode. Things were just going to hell in a handbasket, and there was this dark, like inky black pool, like when we saw something moving through it, and. We had to get through it to get to this island that had this creepy obelisk on it. And I was like, oh, this is great. This is so awesome. We're totally not going to die. We ran through it. But one of uh, our fellow players kind of got like grabbed by this thing. And it was like, had a, it was a fish with a baby's face and tentacles, little baby hands on the end of them. And we were like, Mm-mm. that was a whole lot of note for me. Um, 
and we wound up luring it onto the shore by cutting ourselves and smearing blood all over the obelisk. And then, because there's these tiny little hand holes. Yeah, we, we, were, we weren't going to stick our hands in the <laughs> obelisk, because that's dumb. You just, you don't stick your hand in a yeah, mystery you hole. Stick your hands. So instead, we smeared our blood on it, and the, the, like, the baby tentacle thing like crawled up onto the shore, and crawled all over it, was licking it off, and then it stuck its hand in one of the things and got sucked into the obelisk, and you heard like fish baby grinding noises, and then a portal opened. It was really awful. Oh, I know. <laughs> that memory is stuck with me through a lot of yeah, games. That was months Unwise. ago. <laughs> There's been other horrible things, too, but that that's probably the one. Fish babies that sticks out to me the most. Um, Going for that, what, what about the insanity? What's the biggest insanity? Oh, the biggest insanity the usually is like, witnessing an elder god. Usually that's a big mm -hmm. hit. Like when we, I remember his name, Ithaqua. When Nancy and Pat saw Ithaqua and we spoke to him, that was a huge chunk of sanity. I think we had to roll a d20. Also, reading the Necronomicon, that's like a, a d20, like, like 3d20 plus. Like a D10 every so many minutes you're reading it or questions you're asking it. So never we like, even even about the on. if you're like really low on sanity, you're just it's gonna you're gonna die. Uh, and if you have high what sanity when you start reading it. The necronomicon. What what is the this, this tome? It is a tome. It is the ultimate power of the universe, essentially. Um in our last uh, like basically the arc we just finished. Uh, Yogg Sothoth really wanted it. He'd been kind of writing it, has all the secrets to the universe, unfathomable knowledge, things we can't comprehend or understand, and spells you can gain. You can change the world, you can change the universe if he who has the tome and can read it and can use it can do pretty much anything they want. But it's all horrible. It's all horrible things. There's nothing really good in the Necronomicon. Oh, okay. It twists everything you want. It's ugh, you don't. It's not good. Just don't do it, or do, and don't blame me. Because there, there is magic within Cthulhu. Because there is. Didn't you have magic knitting needles? That was. Mildred. I did. I did. Uh, Mildred's magic knitting needles. I actually uh, carved eldritch runes all into them. Uh, it was kind of hard to see. But that's what I did uh, all last season. I figured an old lady occultist was a hilarious uh, kind of concept. And I was like, well, how would she do magic? And I was like, knitting. Boom. And I can knit scarves for my fellow cast members on stream. Uh, and it'll give me something, because I have, I can't handle horror. So I need, I'm always doing something with my hands, and it gave me some my hands something to do, so I didn't freak out too badly. Um, and I still did, but... Uh, yeah, she cast spells by weaving magic into her knitting through her knitting needles. Um, usually, player characters don't really cast magic, or they have to learn spells that they find uh, as they start to believe in the mythos. You'll find like a scroll, and you lose sanity reading it and trying to decipher it, but then you learn a spell or two. Um, and and magic has a price. It, it definitely does. Usually it costs uh, sanity. Um, you have magic points, which are related to another mechanic. We'll get to that later. Uh, but usually it requires magic points, sanity, and occasional health loss to cast these spells. So it's not like, oh, free, easy magic. Um, and you usually it's not a great price, but you're desperate enough to use it in certain situations. The enemy's always going to use magic because they don't care. They just want to mess you guys up. So beware of enemy spellcasters. They're dangerous. They're usually already insane, so they don't have to worry about it. Chat just uh, highlighting the difference uh, between the Lovecraft horror and modern horror, where it's not always about jump and shock scares, it's more mm -hmm. than the creeping horror. And yes. I, I definitely agree. I think there, there's definitely opportunity in your storytelling to do a jump scare as, as a DM to mm -hmm. set that tone using the music, using the voice cues and things and things. But how do you deal with, with horror and when things start getting towards that line of where you're personally getting you know, the, the heart race. Do, do you guys, do you, do you think it's important to have safety tools and to talk ahead of time about the nature of this game? Uh, I'm sure it would be. Like, I, cause there's different triggers for everyone. I pretty much just have one and I've, I have, and my, my friends know it and it's mm -hmm. never come up in the game. So we're good. But 
Usually, my tactic is to hit the mute button and then scream at my monitor at will and say all sorts of things. That's my typical coping technique is to mute and scream, but if you're playing in person with a group of friends, that is not a good technique to use. Um, so a safety system is definitely something yeah. good to put in place. Um, like, just like, a, hey, it's a bit much. Like, do not hit this topic or touch on this subject. Uh, and that's one of the benefits, I think, of playing online is you can all keep that in the, like the, the sidebar chat so you don't have to interrupt the game to do it. But definitely, if you're getting freaked out, do not hesitate to tell your fellow players or DMs if something is becoming too much. Because you don't need nightmares from a fun tabletop game. It's the purpose is to have fun, but the fact that you are personally involved and invested, I feel, makes it a touch less uh, scary, actually, because you are impacting the game. It's not just things are happening you and you're watching. Power, you yeah. Have, yeah, you have power, and so that... You know, it's not a lot. It's you're just regular Joe, but you <laughs> you have that power in the game, and it's and that in itself makes it feel less scary, at least in my experience. So. All right. It looks like in the we're gonna go for the 1920s. Okay. Um, okay. I just see Classic. some interesting comments as well that I, I, I missed when I was making straw poll, so I do apologize that there's suggestions for Weird West as well as the space setting. And I think chat has some like incredible ideas for different places you could take the game and clearly it's beyond even what I've considered and I love that. I love systems where you can just take it and run and move it to where you want to go. So uh, next week we will be starting on a character in the 1920s. Excellent. Lindsay, when you DM, because I know you DM Call of Cthulhu, how much of a primer do you give your, your players on what they're going into? Um, I usually let them know, I'm like, hey, this is the era, because history does play a, a when you're especially when you're playing in the 1920s, you can pull so much from history. Like, you could have been friends with uh, Einstein, you could know somebody, like, there's all sorts of little connections or events, like the stock market crash, like, that could tie deeply into your character's backstory, so, history is a lot of fun to pull into it. Um, I usually let them know what year it's going to be in, uh, sometimes even, like, time of year, because certain years have a lot going on in them. Like the prohibition ended in December 1933, so it's like certain things like that. At least in the United States, um, I'm a huge history nut too, so that helps. Um, but I usually let them know when it's going to be, uh, and then usually where where it's going to be because location's a big. You could have it anywhere. You could have it in Peru, Indonesia, China, yeah, the Europe, America, Canada, Antarctica. You can literally put this game anywhere. So when, where, and Usually, who is contacted? Usually, someone has contacted them, uh, asking them to come meet up with them about something. Like, oh, your friend, uh, the professor of Miskatonic University, has, uh, you know, has had some interesting research results come up. Please, you know, come visit and talk to him about it. Or uh, one of your friends has gone missing. Uh, you need to go maybe check out his residence, which is here. You know, so certain things like that. I don't usually give them a whole lot because half of the fun is at the investigation. But usually the when, where, and who. That's enough to pull them in and you have a good reason to stick them all together as a group, which is usually they all have the same friend or they all work at the university or something like that. So exciting. I, I was, I've definitely, since I've been moving away from D&D, &D, love playing these, not anti-heroes, but just people who, like you said, are average shows. They're, they have normal self-preservation skills, at least to start with. And yes. it's interesting, I think, to have those discussions between people, you're not just in it for the, the overarching, I'm a good person, I'm going to save the world. You're in it because you have to. There is a reason yeah. why you have to. You get sucked in. Now you're, you, you want to get out. And so, as you lose sanity, sometimes you can you either really cling to that self-preservation or you let it go. You're like, I'm invincible. Yeah, you also have like 12 sanities. So, you know, you're really not, but you believe <laughs> you are. And yeah. it's really interesting to see how different sanities affect different characters. Their sense of self-preservation. Definitely. So next week we will begin in the 1920s. I will write us a mini primer um, that would be something I would imagine giving to players. And mm -hmm. we'll begin building with chat's help this new character with Lindy. Uh, she's staying with us the next few weeks, and I'm really excited. I'll be, I'll be more coherent next few weeks. <laughs> I'm really excited to see what we can create, and we'll delve deeper into these mechanics. We've literally just wanted to kind of get introduced and chat and you know cover the basics of what what is Cthulhu and what is Cthulhu to us 
because different people are going to really focus on different things. Mm -hmm. So, I think that is us for this week on Roll Up. I do want to say a massive thank you to Lindy and a massive thank you to Will for letting me do this. To everyone in chat who has come to hang out and check this out, I hope you'll come back next week to see what we actually begin rolling up and maybe win some dice to roll up your own characters. Thank you to Fancy Grounds, Tabletop Loop, and all of the other sponsors. One big thing this season is this channel is sponsored by Chaosium. And the Call of Cthulhu show is, uh, is Masks of... How do, how do we say this, Lindy? Masks of Nyarlathotep. It took me a whole season to learn how to pronounce that. And now I can finally say it. And spell it. That's, that's the most interesting. And uh, can you give us a hint about what Masks is about? So I can give that a little hint. This week, right? Well, hint. Next week. Yes, it does. It starts on Wednesday. I don't know if we're having session zero or session one on Wednesday, but I have my character all planned out. And I actually, another fun thing about Cthulhu is because you're just regular people, you can sign, kind of team up with your fellow players to create characters that are intertwined with their backstories. So, for example, Grimjack2502 and I, uh, we are playing a husband-wife duo uh, on Ooh. this next season. So that's going to be really fun, I think, as we play off of each other uh, to a slightly different, uh, deeper level of RP to start off with than you would just, hey, I don't know you, because our characters already know each other. Um, but it's a, uh, I know we are supposed to be investigating something, I believe, in Peru. And Masks and I are last attempt, what I just know generally a bit, I've not read it because I don't want to spoil it, is that we travel across the world searching for, uh, you know, these masks, which Nyarlathotep has. And Nyarlathotep is basically one of the uh, great outer beings, older ones, who can transform his visage into many different looks, many different faces. He's known by many different names, which is why it's kind of masks is a fun, you know, uh, nod to that cool. in yeah. lore. Yes. So I'm super excited to see where we go, what we do. Is, there's like eight different countries and locations. I don't know where Will's going to send us, uh, but I can't wait to find out. And that's uh, 1 p.m. EST, I believe. Yes, it's 1 to 4 p.m. 1, before, 1 to 4 p.m. EST every Wednesday for like the next 16 weeks. Where else can people find you, Lindy? For people who oh. want to find out more about the wonderful being that is Lindy and all the things she does, where can they go to start the cult? So I have my own channel. I'm on Twitch, Twitter, pretty much all social media as Laugh Love Lindy. Uh, I play in a lot of Call of Cthulhu, Pulp Cthulhu, Dungeons and Dragons, Firefly RPG, Ryutama. I am a tabletop addict. I'm currently, I think, in nine or ten streamed games, streamed campaigns right now. Um, we're going to be having the last couple episodes of Tomes and Tentacles podcast by Encounter Roleplay come out soon. Ooh. I know it's really exciting. I can't wait to see how it ends. It's um, It's fantastic. The only an hour long and they fit in really well in like the between times and Ben is an incredible keeper. Ben is my first keeper and I love him dearly. Will is also a phenomenal keeper. I couldn't pick which <laughs> one's my favorite because their, their styles are so different that Ben always has a little special place in my heart. First. Um, yeah, just basically check my Twitter when I'm not ill. I usually post my schedule on like the, the Monday of every week of where I'm all going to be because I can't say no and I love one shots too and I just throw them all in. Yeah, I just played way too much tabletop. It's getting Who would suggest this sort of thing? All right, so that's us. Free time? Sleep? Who needs these things? All right, well, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I'm going to go to the tunnel, and we will do our, our second dice giveaway for today. Special Friday special. Jim, thank you for the subscription. Six months in a row, you're nearly there to fish baby birthing time. Yep, three more months and you get fish babies. That's how it works, right? Yep. All right, so thank you everyone for coming to Encounter Roleplay today. I hope you will continue to stick around throughout the coming weeks to see all of the characters we're going to make and all of the characters that get played over the, uh, the various systems and games that Will and the crew are running. So... Let's go to the tunnel. Thank you, Lindy. I will see you next week. See you next week for 